Let's take Josiah Henson. We're in his home. He's born in Charles County. That's one. Then he has to come to Rockville. That's two. I'm talking Rockville Center. Then here, that's three. Then he goes to Kentucky, that's four, and he's traveling, so let's just say there's land in between, that's five. From Kentucky, he goes to New Orleans, that's six. From New Orleans, he comes back, and then he decides to escape. He has a route, that's seven, eight, nine, and 10. He then is in Canada, he moves in Canada, all right, that's 11 and 12. And then he comes back on the Underground Railroad. There are 15 different points of intersection, at least, in this one man's life. And with the Network to Freedom, the, its, its real con contribution is to look at all of these disparate places and say, we cannot understand this story from one location. Rarely can we understand the story from one narrator. We can find aspects of the story in newspapers, aspects of the story in these church histories, aspects of the story in your grandfather's or grandmother's reminiscences, but that we cannot know fully the entire story. So all of the literature prior to 1998 is mostly stories, letters, it's derived from churches, um, a lot of church programs, a lot of course Siebert. Um, you have all of these, William Still, and all of the people that I could name who wrote books about it. There's a um, type of story that emerges. Grandfathers t passing it on, a lot of oral history, very little documentation because people think they burn their records and so forth. That is the legacy that was handed to basically the country. In 1999, we know that um, John Hope Franklin and Lauren Schwenninger write uh, Runaway Slaves, and that starts the new trend, the 21st century trend. You know, they're 99, but we'll let them, we'll grandfather them into the 21st century. And, and the people who wrote the um, original research document, that was highly uh, important because the people who were doing it, Charles Bloxon and um, people from Delaware, they had been working at this for a lifetime. And so thematically, they could say the things, these are what you should look for, this is how this should work, these are the topics, these are where you should look and how you should look. So I think the combination of the scholars and experts who helped with the original study and helped get the legislation, the people who came right behind who were working on the ground in the field doing the work was very helpful. One of the things that I learned, I was an um, archaeological conservator on the African burial ground 30 years ago. And those burials were missed in all of the literature because they were in a 30-foot ravine. And of course, you know, New York was filled in and gridded, so it's flat. And where I learned to really read the topography and really read the land to understand, particularly for African Americans, to understand the geographic signature that I should expect was from the burial ground. That lesson I have carried with me to every single site thereafter because I know I, I, have, I was on a site once where they were looking for some cabins or some African-American presence. I took one look at the map, looked for the worst land, whether it was high or low, and said, did you look here? And I heard later on, maybe a week later, you know, guess what happened? I'm not surprised. So even now, I'm trying to tell folks that this land, some land that we're looking at is going to be inferior. I don't always know what that inferiority is going to be. And at New Philadelphia with Free Frank, it, it, was, it was not obvious. They did soil samples, and the soil was less fertile and less productive than the surrounding land. And in the book, I listed, I think, six or seven things to look for, you know, line by line, inside this geography of resistance. One of them is that there's usually an abolitionist stronghold or well-known abolitionist site nearby. Often the Quakers are near, but if you're in an environment where there are no Quakers, this is where people need to get a little bit creative. 
So when you are lit, when a person is literal, it's very difficult to work with them because they cannot generalize what you're talking about. And so they say, I have no Quakers. But we also know that the free will Baptists further west are people you would be looking for. That's who you would be working with. You know if you're in New England, you're going to be looking for the Congregationalists. So that you're looking for a sympathetic, empathetic um, religious group often. But if you're too literal, and, and that I think when you're trying, people are trying to negate what you're saying, they stay literal. And I think for the Underground Railroad, we often get a lot of naysayers, people who, I don't believe you. That's a way around it, by helping that people understand that the methodology works, but the details and the specifics will change from place to place. We've done, I believe, a good enough job where the academy and the uh, intellectual community accepts the Underground Railroad beyond these tales and lore. We've done all the big people, you know, Tubman and Frederick Douglass. It's now time to look at the family. And it's the same with the, the Network to Freedom. It's now time to get those local stories. It's time to talk to people. It's time to see which, what did your grandmother tell you happened. And I think the Network to Freedom is another place to introduce stories that we have not heard before. And so it, I still feel like it's deeply important to continue with this work.